You're sitting right across from me here. It's great to have you in studio, Thank by the way. Thank you for having me back. Okay, so this is, this is the how and the why are intriguing. If you have the analyst hat on and you say, why are they doing this now? There has to be a calculated bet being made by OPEC and its partner countries on whether or not demand will be there because of these supply cutbacks and price hikes, right? I mean, I think what's so amazing is they kept this whole thing a secret. When we had all the concerns about the banking sector contagion over to physical oil markets, OPEC was quiet. They basically surprised us all coming out on a Sunday, and I think they have maximum market impact. I mean, I read this as putting short sellers on notice. They do not want it to be a one-way macro trade. Like they did in October, they wanted to short-circuit any major macro sell-off going forward. Basically, they're not going to be passengers on the J-PAL Express. They've been very concerned about rate hikes. They see macro uncertainty, but I think they wanted to cement the gains that we were already seeing. So, so in, that, in that case, Bob, if, if this is about bringing price stability back to the marketplace, there has got to be some kind of a reasoning that they're thinking that the world can withstand this, given what still is the remnants of a global banking crisis, although it's abated a little bit. There's still concern about inflation, and there is, of course, still concern about the Fed's efforts to fight it. All of these are headwinds. Why do this now? Well, they probably remember 2008. When, just like now, if you look at their oil balances now, Dom, uh, they point to an increase in the call on OPEC, a million and a half barrels a day, their own numbers. So if you look at their current forecast or anybody else's pretty much, there's no call for a cut. But they remember 2008 when oil prices collapsed from 145 to 35 in six months, and the data analysts caught up with that months later, and they ended up cutting late. They cut in November and December of that year after the huge collapse. To Halima's point, this is about being proactive, preemptive. I mean, they did they broke the glass. They didn't quite hit a panic button, but they hit the precaution button and they hit it hard. And they're basically telling the market, we're not going to let this thing get stupid to the downside if we're about to see a big demand deceleration, which right now is not in their balance and most people's balances. So it's risk management. So so OK, first of all, let me just tell viewers right now I'm watching a lot of nodding and shaking heads going on among all three of our panelists right here. I'm going to turn to Halima first, and then, Brian, I'm going to get to you because I know you're chomping at the bit as well. Halima, Bob mentions 2008, 2009. You were saying, yes, you, you're nodding your head. This is not, though, 2008 and 2009. But the lesson I think they learned from 2008 and, frankly, 2015 was they did not want to let it go too long. I think there was a view 2014, 2015. Remember, they didn't put a floor in and prices collapsed then because of the shale boom. I think they want to show the market that they're simply not going to be passengers. Yes, it was a full year agreement, but they're not going to stay on autopilot for a year. They wanted to show their intention to come back into the market, to be proactive, and at least firm the floor. But many people are optimistic about the back half of the year. So the question is, do they want to put an accelerator on a recovery? OK, so, so let's, let's bring this. There are policy implications globally, of course. But a lot of us care about what's going to happen with U.S. policy because it's been such a state of flux over the pandemic and everything else. Brian, I'll turn to you. You've got a, a, your, your fingers on the pulse of a lot of this. A lot of folks right now in the industry and beyond are asking about what this means for U.S. producers, what it means for shale production. Is this enough to change minds in Washington, D.C., and places like in East and West Texas, where there are oil people who are thinking to themselves, is this the right way to go about catalyzing U.S. production? Well, I think they would. It's a good question. There's a lot of questions in there. Bob could certainly tackle the D.C. side, Dom. I think the people in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico and Williston. North Dakota will just say, OK, if I had more people, if I had access to capital, if I had more people, more trucks, more frac sand, I might be able to produce more. Now, let's be clear. Production has gone up. We're not at the, the record highs. We hit 13 million barrels a day back in December of 2019. We're not there yet. We are slowly creeping up. Is there a max production capacity just based on all those things I just mentioned? There might be. If it is, are we at it? We might be. Higher prices certainly would be some sort of an enticement, obviously, to do that, Dom. But again, uh, you're going to hear a lot of, I guarantee you, we're going to hear a lot of talk, uh, a lot of probably rage right now in the White House at OPEC, at this move, 
This is the higher prices at a time when inflation had just started to tick down a little bit. And it's not just about paying more at the gas pump. It's about all the input costs that petroleum goes into, whether it's for a, a jet fuel, for a, your airline ticket, cruise ship fuel, truckers costs that they then have to pass along. Probably we're going to see a 15 to 20 cent jump in the price at the pump from this based on about a 5 to 7 percent move. I think that's about how it's going to impact consumers as well. I will note this, though. But natural gas prices are actually just at two bucks. They actually went down because the idea being, well, if we pull out more oil, we're going to pull out more gas, and we already have too much gas. So I'm trying to find a little sully side up on that story. But I can tell you right now, and Halim and Bob, I'm sure will echo this. There's not a lot of happy faces in the White House right now. I'm sure there's not.